Turn to your Bibles with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1 is where we're going to be at tonight. I want to preach, and uh, you'll, you'll discover the irony of this a little bit later. I'm just going to preach tonight a good old family-friendly Christmas story. Growing up uh, on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day, we would always, on one of, those, one, of the, one of those family gathering times, we would read one of the Christmas story passages. Most typically, we would read from Luke chapter 2 and read the story of Christmas there. That's where we see Mary and Joseph traveling to Bethlehem, finding out there's no room in the inn, and then the having baby Jesus there in the stable, the shepherds out in the fields, glory to God in the highest, the angels say, right? And uh, so that's the normal Christmas story that we all kind of think of more often. But every once in a while, we'd read from Matthew chapter 1 and, and read about the genealogy of Jesus that's found there, as well as uh, the angel coming to, to Joseph and, and speaking to him and saying, hey, don't be afraid, don't put away Mary. Uh, what, what the, the baby that she's going to become pregnant with is, in fact, of God. And it's a great part of the story that we often overlook. But there's a lot of truth hidden in this passage that I think we, we don't exactly catch on to if we're not careful. And so we're going to take a look at a little bit of that, of that tonight. So we're just going to read a little bit of Matthew chapter 1. Follow along with me, if you will. The Bible says, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren. And Judas begat Perez and Zerah of Tamar. And Perez begat Esron, and Esron begat Aram, and Aram begat Aminadab, and Aminadab begat Nason, and Nason begat Salmon, and Salmon begat Boaz of Rahab. And Boaz begat Obed of Ruth. And Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David the king, and David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias. And then skip down with me, if you will, uh, to... Verse 16, and Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, who was born, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So are the generations from Abraham to David. So that all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations. And from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Jump down to verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. The story of who you are and where you come from can be a big deal to many people. You don't believe me? Look how, recent, how in recent years, DNA tests and services like, uh, I almost said Forever 21, it's 23 and me, <laughs> wrong, wrong 20 number, services that do your DNA tests and tell you a little bit about your, your ethnic and cultural background, but also try to connect you into people from your own history and people that you're related to that you don't even realize you're related to. And I don't know about you, I, for me personally, it's not something that seems all that interesting to me, but I know a lot of people I've talked to are fascinated by their own history and, and the family that they never knew about and the people in their past who did sometimes really, really awesome things and sometimes really, really terrible things. Just out of curiosity, how many of you have done some sort of DNA test or 23andMe, something like that before? How many of you guys have, have partaken in that? Has anyone partaken in it and found out something they did not want to know? I'm just kidding. Don't raise your hand for that one. But it can be very revealing when we look into our past, right? We can look into our history because the reality is, well, that's where we come from and that's what we're made of. And sometimes it can be really encouraging to us or sometimes it can be really discouraging. Maybe you haven't done like a DNA test or a 23andMe or something like that. Maybe you don't know deep into your history like some other people might. But maybe as you look at your own history, maybe in your life or the life of your parents or your grandparents and you look back at that and you realize there's some things there that aren't really good, that are kind of embarrassing, uh, kind of shameful. You see, for the Jewish people, your genealogy was very, very important. In fact, it was so important, it was one of the records that was kept specifically in the temple. And unfortunately, for the nation of Israel, for the Jewish people, when the temple was destroyed, they lost those records. So very few of any Jews really know their true genealogy today. They don't know really what tribe they were a part of, what, what their family line looks like. But for them, that was very important. It determined a lot about who they were, what parts of Israel were given to them and their families, where, what, kind of, what kind of lineage they had come from. 
And it is common for, and as we see genealogies, it's common for genealogies to be listed in Jewish historical writings. But what's uncommon about genealogies is what we see in this one specifically. You see, Matthew here, he includes something that most Jewish genealogies did not include, women. Most of the time, as you went through your family lineage, your history, your genealogy, you would list the name of, of, of the, the male patriarchs as they came down the line. And as we read through Matthew chapter 1, that's, that's very much the commonality here. Most of the people we read about here are men, are, are male, but there are a few that specifically stick out every once in a while. In normal, in, in normal Jewish genealogies, if there was a female that was mentioned, it was because it was a female of, of great importance, one of the matriarchs, right? Somebody like Sarah, the, the, the wife of Abraham, somebody like Rebecca, somebody like Leah, these, these women who were married to the great patriarchs of Israel, the great forefathers of the nation. So they were, they were women of great importance, of, of great pedigree. So why here does Matthew not just include four women, but four uncommon women? Four women who are, frankly, surrounded with scandal and controversy. Let's take a look and see why. So there's four women that are mentioned here in Matthew chapter 1. The first one we find in, in verse number 3, and her name is Tamar. Her name is Tamar. And the Bible says this, And Judas, or Judah, begat Pharaoh and Zerah of Tamar. Tamar was, this is a very interesting story. It's, it's kind of a, not kind of a scandal, it's a scandal. That's exactly what it is. This is not a pretty story. The irony that I open with that I'm about to tell you, a, give you a family-friendly Christmas sermon is absolutely not true because the stories of these women are absolutely in no way, shape, or form family-friendly. If they were made into a movie, I, I blush to think what kind of rating they might be given. You would have to pay extra to unlock to watch this on TV. You would have to confirm your age. That's the kind of scandals we're talking about here. The story of Tamar is found in Genesis chapter 38. Turn there with me if you will. Genesis chapter 38. It is a fascinating and both fascinating and heartbreaking story to read about Tamar. You see, you notice that the two people that Matthew puts together here are Judah, one of the patriarchs of the 12 tribes of Israel, one of the sons of Jacob, and Tamar. But we're going to find something out here real quick. If you read in verse 30, chapter 38, verse number 1, the Bible says this, And it came to pass at that time that Judah went down from his brethren and turned to a, into a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. And Judah saw that there was a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, and he took her and went in unto her, and she conceived and bare a son, and he called his name Ur. And then, and she conceived again and bare a son, and he called his name Onan. And she yet again conceived and bare a son and called his name Shelah. And he was at Shezeb when she bare him. And Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, whose name was Tamar. Wait a second. Weren't we just reading the genealogy in Matthew that said Judah begat a son through Tamar, but Tamar is his daughter-in-law? Yeah, that's right. So let's take a look at this and see what exactly happened here. You see, Judah had three sons, Ur, Onan, and Shelah. Starting in verse number six, we're going to read about these sons and what exactly happened here, at least the precursor of the story. And Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, whose name was Tamar. And Ur, Judah's firstborn son, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. And Judah said unto Onan, Go in unto thy brother's wife, and marry her, and raise up, raise up seed to thy brother. Let me stop here for just a second. What was common in those days is if you were to marry a man, and that, that man were to pass away before you were able to have children to carry on his lineage, the common practice it was if that man had a younger brother who was yet unmarried, it was that younger brother's responsibility to pick up the seed of his older brother and to continue on the line of his brother. Now, in this case, that younger brother was not in, in, in any way, shape, or form continuing or starting his own lineage. He was now responsible to carry the family lineage through his older brother's marriage. So it was now the responsibility of Onan to marry Tamar and to continue the lineage of Judah forward. This was very common practice. This was not, for, uh, for you and I, it seems very weird. For that day, it was very normal. But what does the Bible say? 
Verse number nine, and Onan knew that the seed should not be his. It would not be his children that he would have according to tradition with Tamar. And it came to pass when he went in unto his brother's wife that he spilled it on the ground, lest that he should give seed to his brother. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord, wherefore he slew him also. Verse 11, then said Judah to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, remain a widow at thy father's house till Shelah, my son, be grown. For he said, lest peradventure he die also as his brethren did. And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. So this is the beginning of the scandal, right? So we have Judah. Judah's got three sons. And he finds a wife for the oldest son. His wife is Tamar. Tamar is not a Jewish, a Jewish young woman. She is a foreigner. She is not a part of the house of Israel. But uh, Judah, because he himself had done this exact same thing, went out and found somebody that, that God had said, no, we want, you need to marry someone who is from this nation of Israel. You should not be a part of these pagan nations. There's danger there. But Judah nonetheless did, and he had children of that. Now he's getting a wife for his son from this pagan nation. And so Tamar comes in. She marries the firstborn, Ur. Ur dies. And so now Onan is there to pick, up, to pick up the slack, right? He's there to continue the lineage. But I don't know if you missed this, but Onan, he took advantage of the situation. You see, Onan was now required to marry Tamar. But Onan said this. He said, I may be required to marry her, but I don't have to give her children. So Onan said, but... I can get some sex out of this. That's literally what the Bible says. He goes in unto her. He has all the sexual pleasure that he wants with her, but he refuses to finish the act in a way that gives her children. Yes, that's explicit. I'm sorry, it's what the Bible says. And the Bible tells us that God looks down at what Onan is doing and says, that's wrong. And he takes his life. So now we have two of the sons of Judah, who the Bible tells us were wicked, and God judged them for that wickedness, takes their life. But now we have a problem. There's one son left. And yes, this, this same thought process continues on. You keep going down the lines of sons until that, until that firstborn's wife has a son, uh, children of her own. And so now we have Sheila. But the problem is that Judah says, hey, wait a second. My, my youngest son is still too young to get married. I don't know how, the Bible doesn't tell us how young he is. He just says, wait until he's grown up a bit. You go live with your father, stay as a part of your father's house and wait till my youngest son grows up and then I'll fulfill what is my requirement as your father-in-law to give you a husband so you can continue this seed. Because the reality is, besides having this other son, Tamar was now damaged good. She could not get married to somebody else. Nobody wants, nobody in that day would want a wife who had already been married, who was no longer a virgin, especially. And so they were gonna say, nope, you're done. You wait until this younger son has grown up. But the reality is that Judah in the back of his mind is going, I have no intent to fulfill this. I've already had two sons die as a result, in his mind, as a result of their relationship with you, Tamar. I'm not going to do this again. And the Bible tells us as we continue reading down the passage that Judah then, he goes down just doing his normal business. And he heads down to a city called Timnath where the Bible says he's going to shear his sheep. And so he heads down there and somebody tells Tamar, hey, Judah's heading down to, to Timnath. Ju Tamar has figured it out by now. Judah's not giving me that youngest son. He, she, she knows that the gig is up, right? She knows what's going on. So she says, you know what? I'm gonna start to scheme. And so the Bible tells us that Tamar, she goes and she removes her widow's clothing and she puts on a veil and she goes and, and plays the harlot, so to speak. And she goes to Timnath where Judah is gonna be and she stands out in a public place and and the Bible tells us that Judah comes along and, and sees Tamar, who is disguised uh, as a prostitute, and he, he solicits, solicits her for her services. And Tamar says to Judah, well, wait a second, this isn't free. What are you going to give me to pay for said services? And Judah goes, well, I'll give you a, a goat. I'll give you a kid, a, an animal. And Tamar says, I don't see an animal with you. So what are you going to give me to guarantee that I will receive this payment at a later date. And so Judah then takes off his signet. He takes off his bracelets and he takes and he gives him those two things as well as his staff. These were things that were very clearly his and his alone. It was very clearly identifiable as a person's, right? Their signet, uh, you would more, know, know it better as like a signet ring, something that you would stamp to seal something to say, this is, has my stamp of approval on it. And so Judah he gives this payment, guarantee of the signet, the bracelets, and the staff. And he goes in and has, has sex with his daughter-in-law, who he thinks is a prostitute. Tamar becomes pregnant. 
Judah goes on his way, right? He goes about his business. He shears his sheep. He goes back to his hometown. Tamar becomes pregnant. And word comes, I'm skipping a couple of details in the story for sake of time, but word comes back to Judah finally that his daughter-in-law has become pregnant by playing the harlot. And Judah stands up and says, well, that just won't do. She needs to be put to death. She needs to be burned at the stake for her prostitution. I mean, I'm not going to stop here and, and sit on this for a long time, but the absolute gall for this man who, let's, let, I mean, let's, let's recount this. The Bible gives us no account of Tamar just throwing himself. The Bible literally says that Tamar went out there and stood. Judah saw and said, oh yeah, there's a prostitute. I got some time on my hands. So clearly this was normal for him. This was not something that was odd or out of the ordinary. For him, seeing a prostitute meant, hey, let's go, let's go do that for a little while. And then he does that, he, I apologize, we'll uh, cover, <laughs> I'm sorry, but um, he has that whole affair thing, right? And then later on, now he finds out his daughter-in-law has been a prostitute, and he says, well, we're going to burn you alive. My actions, because they're still secret, have no recompense, but because you are pregnant and now have to deal with this publicly, I don't want to deal with your public sin. I'll deal with my private sin, but I don't want to deal with your public sin, so you need to be put to death. Well, Tamar, now it's time for her to play her cards. And she comes up and says to Judah, well, before you put me to death, I just want you to know the man who did, me owns, did this to me owns these things. And she brings out the signet, the bracelets, and the staff. And Judah's caught. I mean, it wasn't like he was the only one that knows. I mean, everybody knows. Well, Tamar, how'd you get his signet? The man who hired me as a prostitute gave me this as a guarantee of payment. You see, Tamar was wildly taken advantage of. She was eaten up, chewed up, spit out, stomped on, tried to be blamed for everything. Now, it's interesting, as we come, as we come to the end of this story, we have to say, what an intense scandal. And the reality is, as we look at the story of Tamar, I can't find a whole lot to redeem from this story to make application for the love and the grace of God in our lives. This story doesn't end with any kind of moral or happy ending other than you want to be deceptive, you want to be conniving, you're going to get what's coming. You reap what you sow. I mean, that's the best moral of the story that we can come up with, right? And this is the first woman that's mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus, the history of who Jesus is, the people that led up to Mary giving birth to the Son of God. All right, well, let's keep going. Let's keep looking at this. Maybe, maybe as we go down the line, we'll get some better information here about what are these women doing in the genealogy of Jesus. Next, we find Rahab. Rahab is in verse number five, and Aram begat, uh, excuse me, and, and Salmon begat Boaz of Rahab. The story of Rahab is found in Joshua chapter 2. There in Joshua chapter 2, we see the children of Israel coming to conquer the city of Jericho. You know this story, right? Jericho was a walled city with massive walls that you could put multiple chariots side by side across on the top of them. I mean, this city was impenetrable. And the children of Israel, Joshua, as the leader, he sent spies into the city of Jericho to, to see what, what was going to be their plan. And those spies came very close to being caught, but a woman found them and hid them, saved their lives. Her name was Rahab. But not just Rahab, Rahab the harlot. In fact, every, almost every time the Bible brings up Rahab, they calls her the harlot, interestingly enough. Rahab, the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31, by faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. You see, when Jericho, when the children of Israel marched those seven days around Jericho and the walls came tumbling down, there was one section of the wall that remained standing. It was the section that contained the house of Rahab, the harlot. The Bible tells us that all that were in her house were saved. This woman who was a prostitute, this woman who, who sold her body for a living was saved through her faith in God. I don't know much about the story of Rahab. As best as we can tell, according to what we see in the New Testament scriptures, uh, this is something that she put behind her from that day forward. We have no reason to believe, based on what we see in the Bible, that she continued in her prostitution moving forward. But this was a woman who was in a lifestyle that was absolutely opposed to holiness and righteousness, whether it be of her own choice or not, 
but yet she found redemption through faith in God. The Bible tells us in James, the book of James, that, that, that Rahab was saved by faith, that she demonstrated by her work of saving the spies through hiding them and believing the promise of God that she should stay in her home when the walls of Jericho fell down. What a, what a great story of grace. What a, so much better story than that of Tamar, right? Let's keep looking at other women here. We have Ruth. Ruth is also found in, in verse number five here in Matthew 1. Ruth was begat, and of Boaz begat Obed of Ruth. Ruth is the Moabitess. If you want to see her story, go read the book of Ruth. We literally get the entire book of the Bible about her, right? You see, Ruth was, was married to with the sons of a family who had left Bethlehem in Israel during a famine, and they had gone down to Moab, and there the, the, the three sons all took Moabitess women as wives. But all the men in the family passed away, and Ruth and her mother-in-law traveled back to Bethlehem. But when they got there, they realized the life of a widow, the life of two widows, is not a beautiful life. It's a difficult one. But God says a man named Boaz, even though Ruth has no place among the nation of Israel, not only is she a widow, so nobody wants a widow, right? Not only is she a widow, but she's a foreign widow. I mean, she's got two major strikes against her. And Ruth comes, in, comes there by faith and God rewards her faith and gives her an incredible love story through the acceptance of Boaz as her kinsman redeemer. A man who steps up and says, hey, my, my relative passed away and cannot continue his line with this woman, but I will step up and do righteousness by her and give her a life that is renewed and give her children to continue her days. What a great story that Ruth is reminding us of the grace of God in difficult circumstances. And then as we hit verse number six, we see another woman here. In verse six, and Jesse begat David the king, and David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias. Urias or Uriah was a Hittite, one of David's many mighty men. And his wife was a woman named Bathsheba. It's interesting that Matthew doesn't even name her here. I'm not sure exactly why he doesn't. But Bathsheba was another man's wife. And David, who was the king, who was a known womanizer, he had a problem with taking advantage of women, just taking whatever he wanted for himself, especially in the area of sexual gratification, through his entire life. And one night, as the Bible tells us in 2 Samuel chapter 2, verses, or 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 2 through 5, the Bible tells us that David, while he was on his roof, looked out across Israel, and there he saw Bathsheba bathing. The Bible, basic, not basically, the Bible tells us that he saw, he wanted, and he took. The, verse, the Bible says this in 2 Samuel 11, and it came to pass in an eventide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her. And she came in unto him and he lay with her for she was purified from her uncleanness and she returned unto her house and the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. Bathsheba was taken in an adulterous relationship with King David. The Bible is very nondescript about how consensual Bathsheba's involvement was with this. It doesn't exactly say, as I read the story, I'll be honest with you, it seems to me very clearly that, that the king said, I want that, I'm taking it. This is a situation, in my opinion, of rape, of a man with power who said, I want this, and a woman with no power whose husband was away fighting the king's war who could do nothing about it. But either way, as we look at this situation, we know for a fact that Bathsheba was taken advantage of. She was used and abused. David tried to cover it up at her expense. She tried to get her to do, to, he, he tried to bring home Uriah the Hittite into, back into the nation and uh, back into the city and get him to sleep with his wife, with his wife again so that, that she would be, become pregnant by, by himself and that it would look okay, at least somewhat, but unsuccessfully so. And eventually Bathsheba lost the baby because of David's sin. So as we look at these four women in the gene genealogy of Jesus, we have to ask, so what? Why are they here? These are four women who are surrounded in, in scandal, 
in controversy, in incredibly difficult circumstances where terrible things happened to them. They, they made terrible decisions themselves in some cases. As we evaluate it, we see that three of these women were absolutely foreigners, with the fourth more, more than likely being considered uh, a Gentile. Bathsheba, because she married a Gentile, a non-Jewish person, she would most likely have been considered a Gentile, even though she was of Jewish birth. Tamar was a Gentile. She was not a Jew. Rahab, she was from Jericho. She was, she was a Canaanite. Ruth didn't belong as part of the Jewish nation. So we see Jesus' blessing extended beyond Israel with Gentiles even being in his own lineage. What a, what a great idea there. That, and that, that absolutely lines up with what God told to Abraham back in the very beginning of, of all of his covenants with this nation of Israel. He said to Abraham, hey, through your seed, all the nations of the world will be blessed. And that is absolutely true. I mean, I don't know about you, but not many of us are Jewish, but we all have, received, have the opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as our Savior. What a truth that God even allowed these Gentile women to be a part of the lineage of Jesus Christ to bring us salvation through the incarnate Son of God. Without a question, without a doubt, three of these four women were somehow involved in heavy sexual sin, whether it be, whether it be by choice or by something that happened to them without, without their consent. But what's incredible about that is what verse 21 here in Matthew tells us, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. You see, just like Jesus saves us today after the fact from our gross sins, the sins that mar our history, the sins that mar our background, that mar even our own futures, Jesus also looked backwards in time at the sins of Tamar and Rahab and Ruth and Bathsheba and every other person, man or woman and child who had ever lived and said, I am here to save you from your, those sins as well. But without a doubt, all four reveal something strange about the providential working of God in, pre in, in preparation for the coming Messiah. What's, what's crazy to think about is as we look at the genealogy of Jesus, it is so far from perfect. Tonight, we've only looked at the four women who are listed in this genealogy. Could you imagine how much longer our night would have been if we looked at the sins of the men? But these women who came up in a culture that so often saw them as things to be used rather than people whom God loved make up what brought us our Savior. And without a doubt, in Matthew's mind foreshadow the young teenage girl, the, the virgin Mary, who herself would go through her own levels of controversy as she tried to convince the world around her that, in fact, she was a virgin who was with child. She was a woman who had never lost her purity, who had known no man, but yet somehow was showing as if she had. No doubt these women foreshadow the difficulties that Mary would face in her own life as she carried the Son of God. But here's the truth of all of this. It's not that these women were a part of Jesus' story. Excuse me, it's not that Jesus was a part of each of these women's story, but they were a part of his story. You see, Jesus can take any single one of us, no matter our history, no matter our background, no matter our own mistakes or the mistakes of our family behind us, and he can redeem any of it for his glory. My friend, I'm not here to tell you that it doesn't matter what we do in our life because I promise you every single one of these women would tell you, oh, we wish we would have had different circumstances. We wish we would have had different choices. But I am here to tell you that there is a redeemer and his name is Jesus. Who, as the Bible says here in Matthew chapter 1 verse 21, has come to save his people. To save you and to save me from our sins. To give us freedom from the choices of our past. To give us freedom from the choices that we will inevitably, inevitably make in the future. To give us freedom from the choices that other people have made for us that have had such harming effects on us. To give us freedom to now live for God with a Savior who loves us and can use us to further his story and to tell other people about the grace that he has brought, about the love 
that he gives so that we can glorify him together so that you and I can stand here and say with the angels who in their perfection glorify God, but us in our sin that has been redeemed in righteousness of Jesus Christ's son say glory to God in the highest. What a great gift that God has sent through his son through, through these women who we look at, who were used, who were abused, who were mishandled by the world around them, but yet now they are trophies, ornaments of God's grace. You and I can still be a part of God's story. My friend, it's not too late, no matter what you've gone through in your life. God wants you to be a part of his story. Would you pray with me?